welcome back to the dialogue on dementia, keeping safe. And um, we were talking about the connection between dementia and any kind of violence and aggressive behavior. And some people think it's necessarily a part of dementia. And we'll get back to you in a second, Liz, to, to you can tell us about some of the reasons that there might be a connection, because some of them are avoidable. Some, sometimes they, uh, that's what we're here to talk about, that kind of aggressive behavior is avoidable if you know the kinds of things that might cause it. But Gordon, just to paint a picture for us, you've been working in this field for 30 years. What are the kinds of things that you see that would be construed as violent or aggressive? Uh, kicking, scratching, a good right hook. So, um, so what's an example you're, you're working with someone? And like, how does it evolve? How does it come about? Uh, The resident or the individual is, uh, for whatever uh, need that's not being met, um, escalating, uh, frustration, um, uh, perhaps uh, there's a problem with the approach, mm -hmm. um, someone not knowing when to walk away. Um, uh, and so sometimes it's gradual, it sounds like, that there's a relationship, that, that something's happening in that interaction and it's gradual, and at other times is it un, unexpected? Oh, definitely. Um, I'm thinking of an example of a, a person not wanting to have a bath or not wanting to disrobe mm. or not wanting to um, take a medication. And um, if there is sufficient um, stimulus for them to react or uh, respond um, in a violent way, then that's what you will see. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah, it's... So when you hear that, Liz, what, are there other things that we should think about in terms of a reason why a person with dementia may, may, be, may, may act in a way that's aggressive or violent? So you were mentioning that they're, they're reversible things or things that can, can cause people to behavior to suddenly change. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that we, we encourage um, everyone to be aware of is when someone becomes physically ill or is in pain um, or uh, is severely constipated, for instance, that discomfort um, can cause them to, to express their, um, their discomfort through through showing rather than being able to tell. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. if someone... So to rule that out as a possibility exactly. before you jump to any other conclusions. Exactly. So physical illness is, a, is very important. Mm -hmm. or, or depression is another m thing that we see which can often cause people to feel quite irritable and uh, within the, the dementing illness. So J uh, Jane, you as well, of course, have worked in this field for many years. What are some examples of situations that you've seen where there was uh, behavior that would, was violent or aggressive? Sometimes not knowing the person, you know, you just jump in, you never jump in. You must know that person, their likes and dislikes, what they want, what time they want to wake up. It's no use going into the room, opening the curtain, and right away the light is kind of shining in their face. That is a first step where you will get some violence, or pulling the bed sheets without talking to them, without actually connecting with them. So you really, important part is to connect with the resident anticipate their needs. Constipation is the biggest one for me. I, I just freak out when we don't do that. When you don't uh, do when we don't when we don't uh, when don't check it out, mm -hmm. we don't make sure that the bowels are open at least minimum the third day. Mm. Because if you don't yeah, we have noticed the excessive behavior is reduced if you at least by you know the, ha having the bowel movement on the third day. Mm -hmm and also dehydration. Because when they are dehydrated, they are thirsty, they are confused, their electrolytes may be out of whack. It, it's so interesting when I hear you talking, I even kind of wince a bit when I, when I hear myself saying violence and aggression. It, Tara, you're nodding your head. Will you address that? Because it, it feels like it's the wrong word somehow. Well, it does for many people feel like the wrong word, and, I, and that's because um, there is an assumption that those words involve intent, and they don't. Um, mm. When we use those words, it's, uh, intent is, is not part of it. It's violence that incurs that's intentional, that's unintentional due to injury, illness, or 
is, you know, say cognitive impairment. But, you know, I know that terms like responsive behaviors are much more comfortable for most people working in the field. But the truth is that it is, it is an act of aggression or violence, and there are regulations around that, are there not, around reporting and... Yes, um, you know, there are WorkSafe BC regulations around um, employees reporting violence and that employers uh, do their best to uh, inform employees of the risk of violence and um, put um, strategies into place to mitigate um, any violence hazards employees would be exposed to. And Gordon, sometimes when you and I spoke earlier, you said it's kind of awkward to know when to report something when you have empathy for the person who's behaving that way. Certainly, I think we do a fairly good job in, in um, residential care where I'm at, at uh, documenting and verbally communicating these kinds of things. But they're, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, when uh, you're dealing with um, um, people res uh, resistant, or um, we kind of get, we kind of fall into this um, mindset of, well, we got to expect a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. This is part of our job, and we've all gone home on occasion with scratches on our arms or uh, fingers bent the wrong way or um, some bruising, but. Um, General, I would say we do a pretty good job of um, documenting these things, so to prevent uh, further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why you would document it. So, other, Tara, you wanted to respond right. to that? Well, I do think that lots of healthcare staff are reluctant to report because they do um, they don't want to label uh, a, a person with dementia or a, a patient. Um, but what is important to remember that through reporting, it's really about safety, safety of staff and safety for um, people with dementia, residents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because that allows uh, us to look at the situation to figure out, well, what were the stressors in that situation? So then how could we prevent it from happening again? It, it's a really nice opportunity to have a look at what happened and what was the threat to that person, what was the fear or the, the reaction, and figure out um, how, how, what we do about that. And it enables staff to be real detectives, and that's where I see staff really shine, because I find that they, they know a lot. They, they often know the resident, the person with dementia well, and they can put into place things that will prevent, uh, f you know, future future problems. Mm -hmm. I can see you're anxious to jump in. Is that right? Well, I was just saying that reporting in itself it, it may be a legal requirement. The most important part is what do we do with the reports. Mm -hmm. So so long as when when Gordon lets someone know that something's happening, the key is to have the conversation to be sure. As Tara mentioned that that we understand what's going into this. Um, because there, there are many pieces, biological, psychological, and social. And, and just to say, well, we have to kind of expect it, that's, that's that in itself is dangerous. But you can understand why a person would feel that way day after day after day, it's, yeah. yeah. And Jane, it's important in your case then, so that you're the people who are working for and with you, that they know that it's okay to report. How do you set that up? We have tried different things. You know, sometimes if it's a minor thing, then I say, okay, just write in the behavior log. Because if you don't want to fill up the incident report totally, the behavior at least log? behavior log. So then they would write in a behavior log, I was giving care and this happened. Oh, okay. So then you, rec you review that record daily and see, okay, this happened 10 times or this incident happened this way. Then you change the care plan. And you always find an expert in your organization who knows how to do exactly what to do, and they never get hurt. So then you get that person connected, and they need to share that information. And you have, and I know I have many of my staff who are experts at this, and the other staff either get it or don't get it. So yeah. it is important to really share that information. It's put in care plan, and sometimes nobody reads care plans if they are in detail. If you've got a 10-page care plan, nobody's going to read mm -hmm. it. But just have, there's one very, very good document which was put out by Fraser Health. 
look at me. What bothers me when I'm doing, when my behavior is like this, this means I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, or you know, uh. whatever. And that kind of pictorial really gives you all the information right on. You don't, don't need to read 10 pages. It takes some skill, it takes some self-awareness and awareness on the part of the, the caregiver, and man, there you are. You are it. You're listening to this, this language around staff and, and behavior logs, but you're the caregiver. So you've I yourself experienced times when you've had to call 911. I have. Um, Frank, uh, do you want to give me a, to give the example? Do. I, um, Frank doesn't like the squirrels eating the uh, bird seed. And he had an air gun, a little BB gun, and the pellet would go only about four feet. However, he went onto the back deck to shoot the squirrel. And um, he didn't get it, and when he came back in, I was able to take the gun. When he put it down, I took the gun, and then he wanted it again, and I wouldn't let him have it. And he was extremely, extremely angry. Mm. And then he went out. I said to go and throw a rock at the squirrel. And uh, he went outside, and at that time, I threw the gun underneath the couch. Um, when he came in, he was uh, very, very angry, but I could not allow him to have the gun. Uh, there's children in the neighborhood. I know it's a useless gun, but mm. neighbors look at things and you begin to wonder. And so I couldn't let him do that. I tried to divert with more rocks for the squirrels or let's go out and see if we can chase the squirrel away. He wouldn't, and so I told him it was under the sofa but that if he got it, I would have to call someone to help me because he would not listen to me. And I called 911, and they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. They were just wonderful and spoke to Frank, explained what was happening. While one of the officers was speaking with Frank, the other one took me aside. We got the gun, he took it away, and they both explained to Frank that he couldn't have that. Wow. Good for you for, so. for reaching out for help, Nan. I mean, I can see a lot of people would just try to be brave, and just that's, a, that's a, one example of a, a solution or a strategy to de-escalate the situation. We're going to take another short break now. When we come back, this is what we're going to spend time talking about is how do you reverse this? How do you avoid these kinds of injury? Because the behavior is going to be there. So we've got the right people to do that. We'll be right back. <laughs> 